From the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, this is the Princeton Spark. I'm Wright Sinieris. The various people that make up the Princeton entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem have long been at work, taking risks to bring transformational ideas and companies to the world in the nation's service and the service of humanity. These are the stories of entrepreneurship the Princeton way. Hello and welcome to the Princeton Spark, a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. I'm your host, Wright Sinieris, social media and marketing specialist at the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. At PEC, we support Princeton Connected Startups and help to build the regional entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Jersey and beyond. In this first season of the Princeton Spark, we'll explore what it takes to succeed in entrepreneurship from experienced Princeton startup founders, investors, mentors, and more. We'll look at their experiences in different industries, but we will likely see that these experiences are not so different. Through these shared experiences, we will illuminate some aspects of the startup journey for the benefit of early career and first-time founders. In our series opening three episodes, we're exploring three important aspects of entrepreneurship. If you hadn't heard the first episode on taking risks, it's available now at princetonspark.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So do check that out. The very nature of entrepreneurship is doing something new and innovative. And so there's always some uncertainty involved. Navigating this uncertainty is something all entrepreneurs need to do if they want to thrive. So how do they do this? For one answer, we turn to Brooks Powell. Brooks is the founder of Cheers Health, which used to be called Thrive Plus. So in an episode on thriving, I thought I'd go to an expert. My name is Brooks Powell. Uh, I graduated from Princeton in the class of 2017, and I founded a company called Cheers, uh, which we like to call uh, an alcohol-related health company. It was really interesting. Basically, I came across an article that had just been published in uh, 2012, and I, I was reading this a few months after it had been published, titled Dihydromyrecitin as a Novel Anti-Intoxication Medication. And in this article, they showed that DHM, which is a chemical extract like caffeine is to coffee or THC is to marijuana, um, it's basically the active ingredient that makes the plant work. Well, basically, in Asian countries, people would steep this leaf in hot water and drink it after consuming alcohol, and evidently it made them feel better in the moment, and then it also made them feel better the next day. Well, basically, a, a team at UCLA, they took that, they took the chemical extract, dihydromyrestin, injected it into rats, and they found that they could instantly sober up rats, they could prevent rats from becoming alcoholic, they could cure alcoholism in rats, and oh yeah, rats given DHM, so no signs of hangovers. Um, so basically, I took this study, I found it really compelling, I brought it straight to my neuroscience professor, he thought it was so com compelling, he scrapped a planned class lecture and lectured on this instead. Um, and basically within a month or so, um, all of my sort of post-graduation career ideas uh, had totally transformed to me basically thinking, you know what, I'm going to try to start a company off of this uh, dihydromyrestrial molecule. Starting an alcohol-related health company is sure to have much uncertainty around it. How would you characterize the uncertainty that you face as an entrepreneur? Yeah, you know, I think... Our uncertainty is really sort of related to the market that we're in. So, you know, there's never really sort of been this concern that could we make a working product? Would we be able to figure out the supply chain, et cetera? Like some companies face, right? You know, especially hardware companies, they fail all the time because it's just so hard to build a hardware company, um, such as like ring doorbells uh, successfully accomplished or not. For us, the challenge was was this idea of could you actually raise money for something that is alcohol related? You know, would you be able to employ people on something that's alcohol related? Um, and the reason is is that uh, specifically for the VC community, you know, VC you always think of VCs as the pe the investors, the people that give other people money, but VCs really have to deal with people called limited partners, which are universities like Princeton or state pension funds. Um, or high net worth individuals. And so LPs are having to raise money every five years. So, or sorry, venture capitalists are having to raise money from LPs every five years or so, meaning that every investment they make, they don't want some LP looking at it going like, well, why did you invest in that company? Um, and so for the longest time, as we were sort of building this company, you know, we would have 50 conversations with VCs and 60 or 70% of them wouldn't 
really want to take past the first meeting, primarily because they didn't know what their LPs would think of them investing in something that might be able to be characterized as a hangover cure. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was one of the things that we really, there was sort of this uncertainty of, we knew that this sort of category of alcohol-related health was going to become a thing because we were going to make it a thing, but you still have to convince other people, the sort of gatekeepers, the funding, um, that it is going to become a thing. Because I think in 10 years from now, everyone's going to look back and go, oh, alcohol-related health as a category makes so much sense. It's just like the immunity section of supplement of the supplement aisle or the sleep section of the vitamin and supplement aisle or the vitamin C section of the vitamin and supplement aisle, right? Soon there'll just sort of be an alcohol related health section. Right. Um, and so there was sort of that uncertainty is like, could we grow the company big enough where we could start getting funding from these institutional partners? Um, or, you know, would we ever be able to sort of get uh, funding from these institutional partners? Mm-hmm. Through this uncertainty, Brooks' startup is thriving. They raised a $1.2 million seed round in 2018, and they brought a very thoughtful and well-researched effort on a major rebranding to their investors, the result of which, say hello to Cheers. To put it lightly, the consumption of alcohol has its good and bad sides. Even though Cheers' customers call it a hangover cure, Brooks is careful to use other nomenclature. It's a long explanation, and it involves the Federal Food and Drug Administration, but the end result is that they are a dietary supplement in the eyes of the FDA. We have to leave it a bit vague, right? Mm -hmm. We have to say, after alcohol aid, you know, Mm -hmm. feel better, supports your liver. (laughs) Right. Right? But that that enough is enough for consumers to go um, come to their own conclusions about the product and how they want to use it. Interesting, yeah. In 2018, Brooks appeared on ABC's popular television program Shark Tank, in which entrepreneurs pitched in front of a panel of investors led by Mark Cuban. Just to get to that point might have been harder than even getting into Princeton. After the break, he'll tell us about it. The Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, Princeton Department of Athletics, Princeton Association of New York City, and Princeton Alumni Angels cordially invite you to join fellow Princeton alumni, students, and their guests at the third Tiger Entrepreneurs Conference on Friday, November 8th in New York City. A one-day conference featuring dynamic keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Our venue is the fabulous Altman Building, located in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. Tickets and more information are available at entrepreneurs.princeton.edu. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. When we left off, Brooks was about to pitch to the Sharks on Shark Tank, but just getting into the TV studio was a very uncertain process. Every year, every season, there's about 90 companies that get on the Shark Tank. So they do about 25 episodes. Sometimes it's about 20 episodes. Mm -hmm. And they usually have three to four companies per episode, right? right? Little 10-minute segments. Yeah. Um, But they also have this press release that says that every year there's somewhere between 35 and 55,000 people or companies that have applied to Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. So if you end up doing the math on that, it's about 20 times harder to get onto Shark Tank than it is to get into Princeton. (laughs) Um, Which Princeton is already very hard to get into. Now, granted, you know, people that apply to Princeton usually have a shot to get in. So it's it's sort of Mm self-selecting. But it's still still a pretty peculiar fact. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing I, I think people don't sort of know about Shark Tank is really how long the casting process is. Uh For them to go from 35 to 55,000 applications each year to actually getting on the show, it, it takes, you know, it's about six to nine months of casting. So you have to go through all of these different rounds and different steps. Some of it's written, some of it's video pitches. Mm -hmm. And then finally they get you into California and they have you pitch in front of them live and answer questions. And, you know, there's a lot that happens before you actually get onto the stage. But, Despite all of that sort of being such a fine-tuned machine, Mm -hmm. when you get out on stage, what you see is what you get. However, Mark Cuban traditionally does not put dietary supplements on the show. What ended up happening for us is Mark Cuban traditionally just hates dietary supplements. Yes. Because the truth is, like, sort of in the dietary supplement industry, more stuff doesn't work than works. Correct, right? right. 
And, and so Mark Cuban's point of view is, you know, we don't want to bring anything onto the show that could be deceptive towards consumers, mm-hmm. right? And so that's if you actually watch the episode, that's why he's asking so many questions about the science. Yeah. So basically, originally, the producers didn't want to let me and Thrive Plus onto the show because they're like, yeah, it's just going to make Mark Cuban mad. He's going to make it bad TV, et cetera. So what I did is I actually wrote to the producers this 15-page back-and-forth Q&A. If Mark says this, I'll say this. If Mark says this, I'll say this. If Mark says that, I'll say this. Wow. Uh, and so anyways, at that point, I get this email back, talk to some of the producers. They bring me into California, and I say, you know what? In the history of Shark Tank, we've, ne- you know, we've been doing this for 10 years now, and we have never seen somebody do what you just did. We would love to put you in the tank and see what happens between you and Mark Cuban. Brooks won Shark Tank's producers over. They went on the show and pitched. In the end, Brooks made a valiant effort, but there was no deal. They did get a lot of exposure, which made a nice bump in their sales figures. And they are continuing to build and build. You can read about Cheers' alcohol health products. Maybe buy some for yourself at cheershealth.com. After the break, we'll talk about the arts and entrepreneurship. You may be wondering, what do arts and entrepreneurship have to do with each other? Creating art for public consumption is some of the most entrepreneurial and uncertain endeavors that you can undertake. We'll meet an artist and founder who knows his intersection intimately well. She happens to also have both an MFA in dance from the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU and an MBA from Wharton, so she is uniquely positioned for this conversation. Tigers don't meow, they roar. From the Supreme Court to the U.S. Congress, from operating rooms and newsrooms to boardrooms and classrooms, from laboratories, war zones, and trading floors to stages, startups, and writing desks, Princeton women have penetrating views on things that matter. These are change makers in the service of humanity. Listen to their stories. Check out the She Roars podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. There are aspects that apply universally to entrepreneurial pursuits, whether your stage is attached to a microscope or set under the bright lights of a theater. One of these aspects is how to thrive under uncertainty. Hi, my name is Pilar castro Kiltz, class of 2010. I am an artist and an entrepreneur. Elliot McGuckin, also a Princeton alum, he says, every artist is an entrepreneur and every entrepreneur is an artist. How do you react to that statement? I completely agree. I think that artists are entrepreneurs in the sense that they are creating something new. They are building out of nothing something, whether that's a painting, a poem, a piece of theater, whatever it is, they're crafting something that didn't exist before. And there's uncertainty, there's danger, there's excitement. And I think that for entrepreneurs, they're just as creative as artists. I think that's the thing that brings the two of them together is making something where there wasn't something before. But but the truth is, you know, the arts, a piece of art is a product. An individual is providing a service when they create an experience for others to consume, to change their minds, to open their eyes. And as an artist, I think that I, I came to realize that the arts and business live together when I wanted to sell out the house. You know, I wanted there to be people to share my art with, and Mm -hmm. I wanted to be creating a piece of theater that could bring people into a room who are from diverse backgrounds, from diverse experiences, and make a place for them to meet one another, talk Mm -hmm. about something. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to market, and you have to advertise, and you have to create something that's appealing, product market fit. Yes, product market fit. We talk about that a lot in tech entrepreneurship and other entrepreneurship, but it really matters for arts entrepreneurship too. Um, tell me more about that when you, when you think of, when you say that. Yes, I, mean, I think when I think about product market fit in the arts, it's a word that's used in tech entrepreneurship that in the arts I think is sometimes community building, mm-hmm. bringing people, there are other words for this idea of make something that gets right. people to come out, buy a ticket and be a part of this. Mm-hmm. And you know when you look around a packed gallery of people loving a certain artist. No one says, wow, this is real product market fit. <laughs> but that's no, what that's it is. That's not the conversation. That's right. not the conversation. Those right. aren't the, the, that's not the vocabulary that's used, right. but that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. Someone has tapped into a need or a desire and, and created something that meets that, which, mm-hmm. is, which is what product market fit is. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, how would you characterize the uncertainty that you face, say, running a dance production or putting on a show? Wow, wow, that's a big question. There are many stages of uncertainty in putting together a dance theater production. So I uh, was the executive artistic director of this dance theater company, mm -hmm. and I wrote, directed, choreographed the productions, mm -hmm. produced it. And the, the first stage of uncertainty is what are we going to make? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's sort of from the the internal mind of the artist. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, like, the first question of uncertainty is getting the collaborators together. Is it, how are we going to create a team that's going to bring this to fruition? And that's from composers, dancers, actors, musicians. Uh, there's the uncertainty of where are we going to put this up? Uh, you know, is there is there a channel that I can distribute mm -hmm. this product to mm -hmm. my for... eventual customers? Right. And, you know, for, for many artists, that's about, um, you know, there's that difference between, I, I just keep thinking of like, you know, there's direct to consumer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, you're, if you're creating a, a digital product, you can get it right to people. But if you're creating a live piece of theater and dance, mm -hmm. you need a partner. You need a theater to say yes, mm -hmm. or you need enough funds to rent the theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes the latter doesn't happen. Um, so I think that there's, there's uncertainty in, are you putting together a team of people that are going to uh, be able to collaborate effectively? Uh, you know, there's uncertainty in, in the people. Are you mm -hmm. going to be able to put together a team of collaborators, of dancers, actors, musicians who mm -hmm. can pull this pull this off? Mm -hmm. um, there's even just the piece itself. It changes and it evolves as you're going. So sure. the piece of art you think you're making at the beginning, right. what goes on stage is totally different. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, there's, there's also the uncertainty of, especially for one night only productions, mm -hmm. Are people going to come? Are we going to sell enough tickets? Are people going to like it? Right. I did one show that there was a fire on the F train. And five minutes before curtain, there wasn't a soul in the house. Even though we had almost sold out the tickets, there wasn't anybody there. And wow. we realized, yeah, there's a fire in the subway. Sometimes there's a fire in the subway and no one comes to the show. Luckily, they kept the house open and we just started 30 minutes late. Everybody uh, showed up. <laughs> wow. Kind of late, late in the game. Wow. Which made the whole thing more fun because it was a... A play about dating, so you know that's uncertain. <laughs> sure, the most <laughs> uncertain thing of all. The most uncertain thing of all. Will there be a uh, subway fire, and will you find love? Yeah. So. Um, like the same question. The same question. It's the same thing. <laughs> it is the same thing. After putting on these various shows, Pilar identified something that didn't exist in the market that she wished she had. This is often the spark that turns an idea into an impact. After the break, she'll take us through the founding of the Princeton Arts Alumni. Nominations for the 2019 Tiger Entrepreneur Award are being accepted now, a prestigious award designed to celebrate the value of entrepreneurship and innovation across the Princeton community and to emphasize the university's commitment to entrepreneurship the Princeton way. This annual award is given up to four individuals or teams of undergraduate students, graduate students, or early career alumni who demonstrate success in entrepreneurship. Visit entrepreneurs.princeton.edu slash award to make a nomination today. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. Before the break, Pilar had talked about product market fit and the stages of uncertainty in the arts. It's always nice to lean on a network of mentors when faced with these uncertainties, except... I founded the Princeton Arts Alumni in 2013. Okay. Uh, and so what did you see out in the market that required the creation of this group? <laughs> uh, I was, it was actually um, t uh, the late Tim Vassen, who was then the director of the theater program at Princeton. Mm -hmm. I was at uh, his New Year's Eve party. And I went up to him and I said, Tim, I'm ready to talk to the arts mafia. And he said, what's the arts mafia? <laughs> and, and I said, you know, the Princeton arts mafia, just like Princeton has this community of lawyers and bankers and doctors who you can call up and find mentorship. I've written the play. I'm ready to, like, contact the people. And he said, there's no such thing. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? Wait, did he, did he, did, is he like uh, sworn to silence, though, because it's the mafia? <laughs> well, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just said to him, I was like, it would be great. Like, I want to I wanna talk to people. I want to tell them about my play. I want to get mentorship. I want to, you know, learn about it. And, and I, I think I went on and on and on, as I sometimes can. And he said, that sounds great. Do you want to start it? 
And I said, yeah, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, we can make this. You know, that the university can give you funding for two years, kind of let you launch it, then you'll be financially independent. If it works, great. And if it doesn't, we'll tell nobody. It'll be her secret. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was very grateful that when, when I approached him and said, I think that, um, you know, I think we need a, a community of alumni to support each other and to find mentorship and collaboration, find fans and funding and, and whatever that is, uh, that that he and Michael Cadden were both very supportive mm-hmm. of, of making that happen. So mm-hmm. they sponsored two big parties in New York, two annual parties to kind of launch it, get the community together. And ever since then, we've been financially independent since 2015. Great. Having founded the Princeton Arts Alumni Group, she then noticed another critical need in the arts market. The next year, she founded an arts consulting company. If this isn't entrepreneurial, then there is no entrepreneurial. The company is called More Canvas Consulting, and it started in 2014 when I was working as a playwright, director, choreographer, artist Mm -hmm. in New York. And... I wanted somebody who could run the business side of the art, somebody who could take care of some of those day-to-day administrative issues and also answer the big questions that I didn't know Mm -hmm. in terms of strategy and marketing and growth uh, so I could focus on the art. And I asked around, and no one knew of a company who would do that for individual artists and small companies. Okay. Many people are familiar with management consultants, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, the big ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but someone who was familiar with the arts and who could be nimble and affordable. Mm-hmm. And when I didn't find one, I decided to start it. <laughs> right. Be- and, um, yeah, I think that More Canvas, really what we do is we we take care of the administrative so our clients can focus on the creative. In our show notes for this episode at PrincetonSpark.com, you can find links to More Canvas Consulting and Princeton Arts Alumni. In our next episode, we will talk about persisting through failure, we will resume our conversation with Pilar and also with Vitey Murdy, whom we talked to in the first episode of the Princeton Spark. But before that, we will talk to Stuart Allum, co-founder of sustainable sneaker company Thousand Fell. His first sneaker company ended without making as big as an impact as he had hoped. But in this venture, he hopes his newest line of sneakers has as little impact as possible. Download the next episode of the Princeton Spark and you'll find out what I mean. Many thanks to Brooks Powell and Pilar castro Kilts. The Princeton Spark is a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, engineered by Dan Kearns and Dan Kiyu at the Princeton Broadcast Center and produced by me, Wright Sinyaris. Music for this episode is by me, Wright Sinyaris, and our theme music is by The Treadmills. Special thanks to Rose Kelly, David Hopkins, Ellie O'Leo, Tiger Gao, Margaret Koval, Beth Jarvie, Kristen Harold's daughter, Daniela DiLorenzo, Megan Donaghy, Josh Carter, Morgan Spencer, and the whole Princeton Entrepreneurship Council team, which is Anne-Marie Mamon, Don Seitz, Lauren Bender, Diane DiLorenzo, Neil Betwin, and me, Wright Sinieras. The comments and suggestions box is always open. Send an email to sparkpod at princeton.edu. If there is a topic or a person that you think we should talk to, please let us know. If you still can't get enough of the Princeton Spark, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, too at sign Princeton Spark. Views expressed by our guests on the show are theirs and do not necessarily reflect the views of Princeton Entrepreneurship Council or Princeton University. If you rate and review us on the iTunes store, it really does help people find the show. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so at princetonspark.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. The Thrive Conference, celebrating and empowering Princeton's Black alumni, returns to the Princeton campus from October 3rd through the 5th. The Thrive Conference presents entrepreneurial content on the afternoon of the 3rd, featuring keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Registration information is available at thrive.princeton.edu.